Hi, I'm Mike Mahoney. I'm a professional wood turner. I'd like to say thank you for taking the time to watch my approach on how to go about getting started making wooden bowls. I've been a professional wood turner for most of my adult life and I've been lucky enough to be taught and to teach this craft around the world. And I'm always looking for a new idea to translate this process to new and up and coming wood turners. I hope by viewing today I can do that. One thing to keep in mind when you start is to keep your projects fairly small because as the bowls get larger, you're going to need a lot more skill and it becomes a lot more dangerous. Having said that, let's go out to the shop and make some bowls. A quick word about safety while we're working on the lathe. Today I'm just going to be wearing these safety glasses. That's just so I could project my voice better for the video. But typically I'm wearing a face shield and a respirator while I'm working around the lathe. As you know, the lathe throws off lots of material and lots of small fine dust particles. So this is a small price to pay for your health if you're going to be around the lathe for any length of time. Okay, let's look at our dry bowl project today. Now, this is the section of the tree our little dry bowl section came out of, just like this. If you take a look at it like that, and if you turn it over, that's the top of our bowl. It's going to be a face grain or side grain orientation. Typically, most bowls are in that orientation. Now, you can make bowls on the end grain, but typically those are for more artistic venues, and they're not very structural. So, this is the way it's going to be mounted up in between centers there just like this and now the grain is running in this direction as opposed to the way it was cut out of the log. Well here's our bowl blank. I've drilled a hole into the dead center. Now this is the top of our bowl and that hole is about an inch and a quarter and it's going to go over the top of the screw that I have mounted here in the chuck. Now I'm going to introduce two wood turning tools to make this simple bowl and that is our half inch gouge with a fingernail grind on it and this hefty round nose scraper that's going to blend in the bottom of the bowl. Now as you see as our projects get more sophisticated I'm going to introduce more gouges into the mix and hopefully slowly get away from using the scraper. The modern adage of wood turning is we'd rather cut than scrape and you'll soon see the benefit to using a gouge over to a scraping tool. Now things to watch while I make this bowl is my stance, how I'm standing around the lathe, around the bowl, my body movement, of course, and the way the gouge is presented to the wood. All these are very important aspects of making a good, simple form. We'll also talk quite a bit about the chuck and how important it is to us as modern wood turners. So let's put it together. Before I put the tailstock up, let's take a look at the drive here. This is a cup center, and this is much more preferred than any other type of center for making bowls. Now let's talk about how fast our bowl should be moving when we spin it for safety. Considering how fast things should be when they're on the lathe, my good friend and mentor, Dale Nish, always had this formula to dish out to his students, and I still use this when I'm out teaching. Now, he takes into consideration the diameter of the work, and you multiply that by the RPMs, and somewhere that should equal between six and 9,000. Now, our 9-inch bowl blank here, if we rotate that at 1,000 RPMs, we're on the upper end of that formula. I think you'll find that's pretty comfortable and, and safe while you work. Now, if you're on the lower end, it might seem a little too slow, and you might have to speed it up a bit. It's a balancing act that you're going to have to figure out for yourself while you work and get accomplished skills. Today as we work, I'll be pointing out which direction the flute is pointed as we cut across the surface. In this particular case, it's at 9 o'clock, and if I flip the tool over, now it's at 3 o'clock. There'll be variations of this between 3 and 2, and 9 and 10. Now notice the bevel of the tool is on the surface of the wood. If we're using this tool correctly, we're going to try to run that bevel continuously. Notice that the flute is pointed away from the work at all times. Don't get that confused now if I use this tool as a scraper. The scraper means I don't, I don't have any bevel surface here and I just rub a sharp edge across the surface. That would be a definition of a shear scrape or a scrape. Okay, I'm good and snug here with the tailstock. Now my tool rest is parallel with the work. I'm going to get that as close to the work as possible and spin it a couple of times to make sure it runs true. Now, I'm going to turn on our lathe 
at its slowest speed, and then I'm going to work up into a comfortable RPM. There we go. All right, we're going to start off turning right-handed. Now, let's take a couple cuts. The flute is in the direction of the cut, and that's this way here. A nice light cut. Okay, now notice my right arm and tool are fixed to my waist belt here securely, and my hands are fixed. My left hand is on the tool rest, held firmly, and it's going to go across the work. Okay, without cutting now, I've got my legs splayed out, and I start here on the right, and I'm comfortable, and I'm going to come across, my shoulders will move that distance, which is about a little over three inches, and stop. And now I'm a little more uncomfortable than I was when I started. So, if you don't like that movement, you can get comfortable with your, fi with your finish cut here, and then come over here and get to an uncomfortable position here, and then work back to comfortable. Your choice. It doesn't matter. Keep that tool firmly against your waist, and, the, and your hands are fixed, and bring it across and be nice and steady. We're going to be running the bevel here, back and forth. Okay, notice me rubbing the bevel here. The bevel surface is constantly on the wood, just like so. That's enabled me to make a nice straight line across here. Okay, let's start putting some shape into our bowl. I'm going to move the tool rest a little bit at this angle because I'm going to start cutting in that angle there. Nicking off the corners. Okay, I'm going to get closer to the work. Okay, a little bowl shape starting to appear. We're always trying to get as close to the work as possible. I'm getting ready to start to make my tenon here now. Let's take a step back now and look at these tenons up close. Typically tenons are 40% of the diameter of the workpiece. Now chucks are normally sold with these small jaws on them and they'll only open up to 4 inches so theoretically you can only do bowls that are 10 inches in diameter safely. So I would suggest upgrading your chuck to larger jaws if you're going to do larger work. Now let's look at what's going on here. Not as it only important to squeeze that tenon, but we have to develop a 90 degree surface that 
fits on the face of the surface of the chuck. That's very important because if there's a gap, we'll have a failure. Let's take a closer look here on the wood. Okay, let's knock down our tenon just a little smaller now. I'm going to flat the surface behind with a scraping cut. Okay, that's just about the right size tenon we need. This is a little cleft here. This will help us design the work. I'll explain that here in a minute. Our little cleft area that I just put in here, what it is, is there's a line coming down the workpiece here and it dead ends right into that section there. But it, it breaks out on this surface here and this will help us use all this wood as part of our product. We don't want to lose the wood that's in the tenon. Now the reason we made it 40 percent is because typically bowls are about 30 to 35 percent base and that way we can bring this line out somewhere on this bottom elevation surface here. Let's take a look at the tenon here. There's the flat part of our chuck that the wood has to mesh onto. So I have to cut a 90 degree surface between this surface here and this surface here. Now let's do that and the way I know how to do that best is with a skew chisel. If the skew chisel is brought on at this angle you're going to be okay. You never want to bring the skew chisel into the end grain fiber directly like that. So let's give this a shot. There we go. So now I've got a nice right angled surface there and a slight dovetail that way so the chuck will hit right up against that surface. That's most important. Okay, now that we have our tenon developed here, let's take a couple cuts here on the back for practice just to get a nice smooth curve with a push cut. Let's remove our tailstock. That'll give us a little bit more access to the back side of the bowl. couple of cuts just like this before we turn it around and put it in the chuck. A nice light cut here. Watch my body move up. Pretty decent curve there. Now this push cut here is our best cut for cutting the wood cleanly. Since we're going from the smallest to the largest, we're cutting in the proper direction. That's the way the wood wants to cut. One more. Get in here a little bit more where the cleft is. Now my RPMs are set up at about 1100 right here. All right, pretty decent curve. One of the biggest problems I see when I'm out teaching is students cutting in the wrong direction with their gouge against the wood. Now, when we're making bowls typically, we're using face grain and side grain timber. Well, we want to cut from the smallest diameter to the largest because there's always a longer fiber taking the place of the grain that we just cut. So if you cut in this direction, what you'll get is a lot of broken fiber. Now, we're always looking to do this, so we have to recognize the grain that we're cutting in order to be effective to cut it properly. So think about it. Um, take a few cuts 
in this direction just for practice to see how difficult that cut might be because you're going to start turning the corner here and going right into the end grain fiber whereas you won't find any end grain fiber if you start here and work out. Okay, let's talk about one more cut we can do here before we put it into the chuck. It's called a shear scrape and it's my favorite cut because it's easier to do than the push cut. And what it is is we're going to take the gouge and point the flute at the wood almost and then we're going to move up the hill like this. Now notice the tool is at a shear angle and the, it's almost straight up and down here. Now a lot of mistakes are made if you bring the tool up into a horizontal plane and you don't want to do that because that's peeling and you won't get as much of a clean cut that way. So let's shear at it by going like this. Let's give it a go. And you'll see a nice ribbon come off of that. And this will re redo our curve here if we need to. If you have any high spots on the surface, you can go right to those high spots and knock them down to blend in the line. I really appreciate this cut. I try to get it as steep as possible to the wood. And now the gouge is almost vertical, it's so steep. And the steeper it is, the cleaner the cut. You can see those little ribbons. That means I'm cutting clean. Soften it up. All right. Let's go ahead and put it in the chuck and refine our shape a little bit more. Okay, let's put it in the chuck now. You can see I've got a nice smooth surface there all the way around to chuck up against to. Let's tighten that up. Excellent. Now, you can see there's no gap on the face of that chuck in the wood. If I do, I have to recut it or otherwise I'll have a failure. Now, let's clean up this exterior surface here and shape it the way we want it and then we'll hollow out the inside. Here. Okay, let's face off the front of the bowl here now. I'm going to get the tool rest as close to the work as possible. I'm going to test for my tool rest height right now. And I know I'm at the right tool rest height when my tool is laid horizontally and the point runs right through the dead center. Now I'm ready. Here we go. Now, this is the flute is pointing directly at the face grain or the top of the bowl. Back and forth. Now, that's the easiest way I know how to face off the bowl. Now, if you turn around, the gouge and go towards the center, that's an end grain cut. It's a very difficult cut to make. It's one I wouldn't choose. So I turn around and do a peeling scrape type cut back and forth. The key here is that our tool rest is as close as we can get to the work. And if it's far away, you'll get a catch. And now here's another look at another cut. This is a peeling cut. Now the flute is almost pointed towards the ceiling. And that's kind of dangerous. So don't do it unless your tool rest is right next to the work. So I'd rather lay the flute directly flat, almost at a 9 o'clock position here, and just scrape off the top. That should give me a nice clean surface for our rim here to dive in. Yeah, all that's cut clean. Okay, let's talk about how we're going to haul this out. Since this is face grain or side grain wood, you can see the grain running in this direction. We want to make cuts in this direction at all times because if we make cuts like this in that direction with any force, it's really going to put a lot of stress on our tenon where 
this, the end grain there is at its shortest. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a little indent like that, open it up a bit, get a little bit more depth, open it up, a little bit more depth, open it up, open it up, more depth, and so on. We're always trying to work in that direction. Okay, let's go to hollowing out now. Got my tool rest height this right. Let's go right into this area here. About uh, 1,000 RPMs on this little bowl. Now I've got my bevel on the surface and I bring my right hand out and dive in. Now let's open it up just a bit. Now let's get more depth. Working that way. Okay, there's my bevel. I'm going to cut in that direction. The bevel needs to be in that direction to start. And then it slowly comes towards the center. There we go. Let's open it up some more. There's our bevel going in that direction. Okay, let's open it up a bunch. Some more depth. Open it up. Now, a common problem I see, if I take the tool and push in that direction, that's end grain fiber. So I don't, that's a huge ledge right there of end grain fiber. What I'd rather do is nick it down. Just like that. Again, nick it down some more. Okay, make sure you don't push past center. You can get injured doing that. So make sure the gouge stops right there at center.
Okay, we're getting to the point where we really have to start thinking about our wall thicknesses. Now, if you notice here, I'm thinner here than I am here. I always have to have more bulk down here than I do here because I need structure there to make cuts up here. Now, we're going to start nicking at the top for our finished cuts here, just like this. And if we like what we see, we can proceed further down into the, into the bowl, like this. So we go from the top to the bottom. We have to do that because once this gets thin down here, it's going to be really difficult to make cuts up here because you're going to be putting too much pressure with the tool that way and the bowl will start to flex on you and it'll come back and you'll cause some troubles there. So always keep more bulk here and start from the top to the bottom and get a nice smooth curve all the way through just like that. Okay, notice my body movement. When I start the cut, I'm going to support the tool and I'm going to lean over and get the bevel in line to make the cut in that direction. And I have my arm supporting the tool handle just like this. The motion was bevel in the direction of the cut supported with my thumb here, the tool handle supported by the back of my elbow, and I push straight down into the same exterior line that I've got, and then I'm going to make a nice deep cove by manipulating the tool towards me and out. And you notice my body started here and went all the way to here. I'm at the point now where I have to start thinking about my rim here. I don't want to cut down and get this too thin and I'm actually about twice as thick here as I am there and that's a good thing because again I need that structure. But if I start making cuts down there I can't develop my rim because I won't have enough bulk there to make cuts up here. So let's think about what we need to do here. I'd like it straight across on this particular bowl, but you can cove this or make a convex surface. Whatever you do, make sure you have bulk down here in order to make cuts up here to develop the rim. Okay, I'm going to fix up the rim here. I'm going to get the tool rest as close to the work as possible. It has to be nearly touching. Now I've got three options here. I could push cut straight across with a bevel in the direction that I want it, just like that, or I could peel it with the flute up or I could roll the flute over into the nine o'clock position here and just scrape it. Scraping's okay in this situation because this is flat grain. There's, there's no end grain or side grain. It's just flat right there. So a nice easy scrape if I'm just going to go for a flat type of rim that works great. Let's try a peel now and that cut is, is fine too as well as long as I'm right next to the tool rest to make it. Now let's try a push cut. A little more of a struggle to make that cut because I'm mainly hitting end grain fibers as I push it through but it works fine. Let's go back to the scrape. That works out good. Now we'll develop our wall thicknesses. Okay, our rim is done now. Let's finish up our wall thicknesses. I want to get that about a quarter of an inch thick for this bowl. The flute is going to be in the 230, 3 o'clock range and now my bevel is going to go pointing in the direction I want to cut and now I'm going to support the tool because the tool will have a tendency to want to roll across the rim. And the reason that is is that I, if I don't touch the point, the dead center point first, it'll want to travel. So I'm going to support it, but try to hit the dead center anyway by bringing the tool up into a horizontal plane. There's my support. Bevels in the direction I want to make the cut. Now, 
now I have bevel support. I can lay my bevel back onto that surface and take her in. Okay, let's stop right there. I'd like to think of this bowl into three sections. I just did the top third. Now I want to make sure that all my tool marks are pretty good there because if there's any other cuts that I have to make up in this region, I don't want to remove wood down here. Everything looks pretty good. There's a little bit of chatter work. Maybe I'll just take a lighter cut over that and see what happens. A little less wood now and that will help. Okay, that looks better. That high pitch sound is just that thin wall there. Yeah, this is all nice and clean here. Now I can proceed deeper here. So I'll go down to the next third, right to there. Lay my bevel back on the wood surface. Okay, let's stop and check our progress. Got a little more work to do. A little tool mark right there. It's slightly a bump there, and I'll get rid of that right now. All right, that feels much better. Let's take a look. Yeah, I've got a nice smooth line going right to the center. I'm probably still a quarter inch from being finished on the bottom, so I've got to go that way about a quarter inch. Now, I can elect to stick with my gouge, um, and if you're not too adept at using the gouge, you might not want to use it and go to the round nose scraper. Well, we're going to go to the round nose scraper now. As reluctant as I am to use this tool, I feel it's an important tool if you haven't spent a lot of time behind the lathe. It's great for blending in the curve here at the bottom of the bowl. Now, as you'll see in our next couple of projects, we'll neglect to use this tool and we'll go to gouge cuts because I feel it's going to give us a better curve and a nice clean cut surface and we won't have to sand as much. Let's go ahead. Now, what's going to happen with the scraper now, all scrapers are held with the handle slightly above the area that makes contact with the wood. And here we go. I've moved my tool rest in a bit more and I've raised it up again so the tool handle is higher than the cutting surface. I'm going to slow our bowl up a bit too. Yeah, I'll get some depth. Okay, let's stop and check that. Okay, that feels pretty good. <clears throat> let's check our wall thicknesses. Okay, that's a nice curve there. Now, one thing I haven't done in this bowl is check our wall thicknesses or our depth. In order to check our wall thicknesses, you're going to need a nice little set of calipers like this, and this will tell you everything you need to know about the thickness of your bowl here. 
Now that looks pretty good. I'm slightly a little thinner here than I am up on top, but that's okay. I'm going to live with that. And it'll actually feel a little bit better in the hands. And my base is going to be a little thicker than my walls. And I won't bother sanding this bowl because I'm going to cut it in half so we can critique it that way. But let's check our depth. Okay, in order to get my depth here, I'm just going to take any straight rod, put it at the bottom of my bowl, draw a line from the top of the bowl here to the back side of the bowl, and put my tip of my finger right on that area, drop it over the top, and then draw a 90 degree surface down off of that surface, and that tells me where my base is. So I've got a good 3 eighths of an inch here to the bottom, and that's going to work great for this bowl. Well, our depth here is just right. Now we've got to talk about removing the tenon here where the chuck has gripped it. There's more than a few ways of doing that. And you can use a vacuum chuck, a tension drive, or a set of these coal jaws that'll grip a series of diameters, and that'll get you total access to the back side of this bowl. But if you're not inclined to make a purchase like that, we'll use a jam chuck. So let's set up to do that. Okay, I put my screw back in the chuck, and I've got this MDF little wafer here, and I'm going to cut a groove to jam the exterior of this bowl to get access to the back side here. Okay, that's good and snug. Now, let's cut our groove. Okay, to start here, I'm just going to guess at where I'm going to cut my groove. I'll use my parting chisel now in order to make that groove. Let's check that diameter. Yeah, that's real close. Now let's cut in a bit and see where we are. I've got to cut a little relief there so the whole bowl fits down inside this 90 degree groove here. Let's check that. Just a hair small yet. That's good. Gonna work out. Again, that line is 90 degrees straight back from this surface. Let's check that. Still a hair too small, that's fine. Let's try that. Slowly working out. If you cut it too big, then you've got to get another piece of wood. Okay, I'm right on. Now I'll cut that straight back 90 degrees. Little depth. Let's check that. All right, that's a good snug finish. Make sure it runs true, it does. Now I'll bring up my tailstock and we can get total access to this back side. Okay, let's snug up the tailstock. Not too tight, it's just holding our bowl there, supporting it while we make cuts. Now I'm gonna make a series of shear scrapes here up the hill, smallest diameter to the largest here. We don't want to use a push cut going downhill. I won't remove much of this area here because I want to keep as much base as possible. Let's just blend in this line nice and neat. Okay, I kind of like that reverse curve there, and that'll make for a nice, simple form. 
Now I'm going to concave my base here a bit so the bowl will sit flat. That's just our scraping cut. Okay, let's remove the tail stock now. Now we'll get to that nub area right there. I'm going to take a really light cut. Okay, now you can put a little detail in here if you like, sand it up and call it good. But we're going to cut this bowl in half and let's critique it. I'm going to tap the back side of this to release it. There we go. Well, okay, that looks pretty good. I got a little thin there in the midsection, but I think that would have given this bowl a good feel when you picked it up. Also, I've got a good thickness there at my base, so I'm pretty happy with that. Not bad. Well, let's go ahead and get set up to do some other projects. I've got us out here in the wood yard spotted some American elm to be perfect for our natural ledge. Let's take a look at it. Yeah, this is beautiful stuff. This is American elm. came out of a homestead near my house. It's freshly cut. It looks to be about 10 inches here, so I'm going to cut it back 10 inches this way, and then we'll split it down the middle, and we'll work with both halves of this. You can see I've got a pith crack that goes just like this. A little bit of it like this, not, not a whole big problem here, but I'd like to run my chainsaw right down through there. That'll give me my most yield. Okay, I found some brown hard ash here that'll be great for our calabash. I've got a pith crack right here. I've drawn a line where I'm going to rip the chainsaw right there. It looks to be about 11 inches. That'll be great. Here's our natural edge bowl project. As you can see, I've chiseled a hole right into the dead center so the spur drive won't spin out as we turn it. Natural edge bowls have been a great project for me over the years, and it shows great command of our craft if we do this properly. Since the natural edge bowl has an undulated surface, I'd like all those surfaces to blend in and be balanced when we finish the bowl. This piece has two high sides and two low sides. The two high sides will be balanced and the two low sides will be balanced as well. And I'll show you the process and how that's done. So let's mount it up between centers. I'm going to take my spur drive, a little four-prong spur, and drive that hard into the top surface there and mount it in between centers. Got us good and tight there between centers. 
Let's get our tool rest parallel with the work as close as I can get it. There we go. Spin it a couple times, make sure it all runs clean. Got my tool rest at the right height. Let's get to a comfortable RPM. Now, flute in the 9 o'clock position. Careful not to push too hard up in this section, you might knock off your bar. Nice and easy as you go past that bar. Let's take a push cut downhill against that bark and that will keep it from breaking off the bark or breaking it off. go. A little bit more here. Okay, let's balance this piece. Well, if I look here, I'll go to the first high side here and take a look. And I'm going to put my thumb at the top part of that and see where it corresponds 180 degrees on the other side. I'm about almost three, quarter of, three quarters of an inch below the other side there. So that tells me that the high side has to drop half that distance. So I'm going to do that right now. We'll drop that about three-eighths of an inch. Now I've loosened up the tailstock and gave myself a new center on the back. Now let's try that again. There's my high side. Let's bring it over. And I'm right on. Now the two high sides are exactly on the same plane. Let's try the low sides here. I'm going to go to the top part of the bark here, drop my thumb there, and see where that corresponds. Well, I'm a little low on this side by about a quarter of an inch, so I'm going to manipulate this side up half that distance, so an eighth of an inch. Not much at all. Squeeze it back in. Let's try it. So far we're balanced. We may have to check again one more time. Let's go ahead and true it up 
and see how our balance is. So we're a little out of round, but that won't be a problem. A little more speed here, about a thousand RPMs. Very softly around that bar. Okay, let's check our balance again. A lot of bark on that high end, but a little bit of that's going to come off. Okay, we're still within balance. Now I'm going to put our tenon in, and everything should be fairly balanced when this piece is done. Let's put our tenon in, about a 40% tenon again. I'm going to flatten off the bottom. Now, since this bowl is not as functional as our first bowl, I can go with a much smaller base when I'm done. But I'm still going to use my 40% tenon for a safety factor. And there's my little cleft there, and that will give my mind's eye to see a much smaller base when I'm finished. Let's go ahead and fix up our tenon. Okay, let's put a nice right angled surface right in there. Here's our skew chisel. There we go, a nice little right angled surface there. The truck will hit right on the front. Okay, in the chuck, grip it nice and tight, I'm going to check for some gaps, looks right on. There we go, now let's put the tailstock up and make a few shear scrapes to clean up the exterior. Nice shear scrapes. Natural edge bowls lend themselves to a nice simple curve. Now I'm going to cut downhill here for a second to clean up that bar. Okay, a nice little bell shape there. Now I'm going to come across with a shear scrape to finish up. Lightly here on the bark. Nice soft curve. Okay, let's stop and check our tool work. Yeah, it looks really good. I've got a nice soft curve too. A little bell shape. That'll work fine for a natural edge. Now, we won't go back to this surface. We're going to start to hollow out the interior now. Okay, I've got my tailstock away. Let's set up to hollow out the inside. Check for my tool rest height. A little high. There we go. Now, having an undulated bark surface like that isn't much different than our first dry bowl project. However, I will be going in a little softer, but I'll still be getting my depth, and I'll be opening up as I get my depth. Get as close to the work as possible. Rev up to a comfortable speed. About 800 RPMs here. Go 
will be a little bit of cambium layer that clogs up your gouge there. Don't, don't be worried about that. Okay, get some depth. Open it up. More depth. I'm about an inch away from my finished depth. Let's open it up. Okay, let's look at our wall thicknesses here. Now you can see I'm about a half inch right up here on top. Let's go look at the side. About five eighths of an inch. So it's thicker down below the high area here. And that's exactly what I want. And I've got a lot more bulk here. Now I've got to start thinking about getting my finish cuts right here. And then I'll remove the bulk down here later. Okay, just went to the grinder. Got a good, fresh, clean, sharp tool. Now I'll go in for our final wall thicknesses. I'm going to bring our tool rest in basically trying to match the exterior curve on the interior here. It'll really become glaring if we miss our wall thicknesses here because this high elevation here will have to look like the lower elevation here. So we're trying to make those look fairly consistent. Make sure that runs clean. Now the bevel is in the direction of the cut right there. That's how I'm going to start and I'm going to push in. Easy. Okay, let's stop and check. I'm going to go for about a quarter inch here and I'm a little heavier than that now. And my wall thickness is here fairly even so I'm doing everything correctly. Let's just nick off about a sixteenth of an inch and go down about a third. Okay, let's stop and check. Yeah, those are even, so now I can proceed. You see I stopped here at a third. I didn't want to go any farther because if I had gone farther, it might be more difficult to make cuts right here. And it would give me a little bit of chatter work and it would be really hard to sand out. So let's go down another third. 
Pick up right where I left off. Put the bevel on that surface, that freshly cut surface. Yeah, let's bring the tool around. I'm going to open up the flute as I get close to that center. That's a pretty difficult cut coming right through here because that's end grain fiber. So I just have to take a lighter cut in order to keep the grabbing down. Flutes in the two o'clock position. There we go. Stop before I hit the big wall there. Let's check that. Not a bad wall thickness. I've got to take a little bit out right there. Feels pretty good though. Got a decent curve. Let's take a little bit more out. All right, that feels good. Let's check our wall thicknesses. Feels real good here with my hand. Excellent. Gradually getting a hair thicker as I get down below. Now let's introduce our traditional grind here instead of using our round nose scraper. The traditional grind is almost ground straight across. It's about 80 degrees here instead of 90. This is a much better tool to pick up end grain fiber like this and gradually I hope you can eventually use this tool instead of the scraper because you'll get a much cleaner surface here. We're just going to have to ride the bevel throughout the whole curve to create a nice soft curve. I'm going to go to the high spot right there and it really goes over end grain fiber really nice. You can see by the ribbon it creates a nice cut. Okay, let's check our depth. It's a little trickier to check our depth here with a natural edge. Just have to be patient. Now I can go another 3 sixteenths of an inch. So I'm going to go right after that depth, that 3 sixteenths of an inch. Okay, there it is. Now I'm going to blend the curve in. Notice the motion of the gouge. It's being swept through in an arc. In order to hold the bevel, the tool has to come through in an arc. There we go. All the way through the center. Hopefully I've got a good curve there. Let's check it. Feels really good. That's a nice curve. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Well, we're going to sand this bowl up. I'm going to have to wait about 15-20 minutes for the moisture to evaporate off the surface. Then I can sand this and this will be a beautiful bowl. Okay, to remove the natural ledge bottom here, I've got a little different strategy because we don't have a solid area here like we've had on our other pieces. What I've done is I've manufactured a little waste block here and it's called a tension drive. And I'm going to drive along this surface here with the bowl held between centers and the tailstock up against this surface here. 
I'm going to use a little paper towel here to soften up this area because I don't want to indent all my nice sanding and clean wood there. I'm going to use this paper towel here and that'll be fine. Neoprene works great, soft leather, that would be great. Now, this has to run true and I can't have any folds in my paper, otherwise nothing will run true. Let's put it up against that, check it out, tighten it up just a bit. Yeah, that runs true. Now I can get access to this area to remove the bottom. Oh, spun out a bit. Now, since this isn't a very functional bowl, I'm going to get the base fairly narrow. A little reverse curve. Bring it up series of shear scrapes, blend that curve in, there we go, nice line coming down here with a slightly re reverse curve. Now I'm going to concave my bottom, now I'm going to sand this surface here to blend in with my other sanded surface here. Now I can't get to my nub here the way I've got it chucked up. There's just no way to do it without a vacuum chuck, but that's okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stick a two inch disc sander in my drill press and then I'm going to grind and sand that area away and I'm going to make that as clean as neat as the rest of the bowl. And then I'm going to sign it, date it, and tell everybody what type of wood it is. Yeah, that's a nice little natural edge. Now when it sits on the table here, notice the two high sides are equal and the two low sides are equal. That's exactly what I'm looking for with a natural edge bowl. I like it. Here's our calabash bowl project here. The term calabash comes to us from Hawaii and it's basically a gourd shaped bowl without a base. And I love to introduce these into a classroom situation because it really helps the students understand how to put voluptuous curves on their work. And that's not easy to do if you're just starting out. This will also give us the opportunity to talk about the drying process. We'll act like we're going to rough turn this piece and set it aside for a future project once the moisture is dissipated out of it. I hope to give you the pointers to make you successful in that because it will make you much more versatile in your bowl making. So let's go ahead and set it up. I've got a four prong spur here. I'm going to pound that into the top and we'll put it in between centers. Okay, let's rough it down. More of the same here. My tool rest is close to the work. Ramp it up to a safe RPM. There we go. Okay, before I go too far, I'm going to flatten off the top surface here with a scraping cut. I get my tool rest as close to over there as I can get it. There we go. A little scraping cut. The flute is in the 3 o'clock direction. Take a look at it. Wow, that looks really good. Okay, let's refine our shape a bit, put our tin in. It.
Now the calabash has usually a little reverse curve right up in this area here. So the bowl is fairly enclosed. A little shear scrape here. If you can picture a gourd cut off in the midsection, you'd have your shape. There we go. Okay, nice and secure here in the chuck. This bowl is considerably heavier than our dry bowl blank since this is green. I'm going to use the tailstock there for support while I refine the shape before I hollow it out. Blend in our lines. Very soft, simple curve all the way through, and that'll even be more so when this continuously flows down into a no base situation. Check for torn grain. Looks good. I've got a nice curve all the way through. Okay, let's hollow it out. Okay, I'm going to face up the front and then we'll dive in. Flute at 9 o'clock, more like 9.30. There we go, let's plunge in. Get some depth. Soft cuts here. We've got a lot of bulk yet to remove.
Let's talk about the drying process here. What I've done is I've left my wall thicknesses here 10% of the total diameter of the workpiece all the way through. Now what I do in my shop is I date this piece, then I mop a green wood sealer inside and out. Greenwood sealers are sold at wood turning supply houses strictly for this purpose. Then I set it aside for 90 or 120 days and then I return it once the moisture is dissipated. Now I live in a very dry area in Utah and if you live in a more humid climate you might wait considerably longer to dry this piece. But I highly recommend you do it because there's no way you can dry a dry piece of wood like this of this size that doesn't have cracks in it. This will greatly enhance your wood turning experience and give you a lot more variety and it'll make for some great family heirlooms. Let's go ahead and finish up this bowl. This will make for a nice beautiful green calabash. Okay, stop right there because you'll start running into end grain fiber right there if you go in that direction. So we're going to leave off right there, check our wall thicknesses. There we go, we're even all the way through, that looks great. Now let's finish up with our traditional grouch. right through the center. There we go. That felt really good. Kept the tool going in a nice soft arc and the line is excellent. I'm very happy with that. Now we're going to sand this up and take the bottom off.
Oh, that feels like a good curve. Tap the back. Beautiful little bull. Nice subtle curve. Little reverse curve there. Great for a bull to sit in your lap to eat popcorn. Well, I don't think we did that bad today. There's our calabash bowl in motion. That's a beautiful bowl. I love the way it just rocks there on the table. Believe it or not, it's a fairly stable bowl. It will never tip over. Good bowl to have around the house. Well, one thing I failed to mention today while we were working with these green timbers, we need to keep our wall thicknesses fairly thin and consistent all the way through. That way they'll dry evenly and slowly and it'll keep our cracking down to a minimum. When we're done with them, we're going to keep them in a cool dark place so they will dry slowly. I hope by watching today it'll make this process a lot simpler for you and I hope that some of your bowls will become beautiful family heirlooms. Let's talk about power sanding real quick. Power sanding is an often overlooked discipline and it's rarely taught and that's unfortunate because there's a lot of dynamics that are going into uh, power sanding when we sand our bowls. Now we're going to focus in on these little hook and loop discs. Now I use the largest disc possible for the product I'm sanding because think about this, if I use a two inch disc on a maybe a 12 inch bowl, it doesn't last that long. A three inch disc has twice as much surface area than a two inch disc and therefore it's going to last longer. And also you get what you pay for when it comes to sanding discs. So if it's a cheap disc, it's probably not going to last very long. Now, this is a typical sanding sequence I would go through when I'm sanding my work, 8120, 8220, and so forth. What's going on here is there's not more than a 50% jump in number. And if there is, it's going to be much more difficult to remove those heavier scratches with a finer grit down below. Also, if I use a brand new 80 grit here and I use a worn 120 grit to try to get those 80 grit scratches out, it's going to be much more difficult to do. So let's go ahead and look at how we sand these bowls. Okay, I've chosen this maple piece because it's nice and light and it'll show torn grain really well. One thing to note here is when we're on our coarser grits, the drill is moving so fast and the lathe is spinning at about 500 RPMs, I don't want to hit the dead center with those coarse grits because I'll create a divot and ruin my nice tool work. I won't touch the dead center for any length of time until I get to the finer grits, 220, 320. Now let's go ahead and sand. Let's look at some uh, torn grain up close. Okay, you can see some really bad torn bits right in this area here. That was caused by the ripple in the figure of the wood. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my power sander over those areas before I rotate the bowl to sand. But I'll constantly move the sander so I don't create any flat spots on these surfaces here. So let's get rid of that torn grain. Now I'm trying to use the whole face of the disc here. It's the whole surface is on the wood there, not on the angle. I see a lot of people use it on the angle and that's not what you want to do. You want to use the whole surface of the disc. Now once we have all this torn grain out and all our tool marks, we can rotate the lathe. Okay, I've sanded all the way through with my 80 grit now. Now I'm checking for any torn grain or tool marks that may have been left behind. It looks pretty good, so now I can proceed. Well, let's take a look at what the sander's doing. In this case, I'm going to spin the lathe in the forward motion, and my drill is going to be counteracting that motion. So I'm going to use the right side of the disc only, about 50% of the disc to the right hand side, and I'll work from the center to the outer rim, center to the outer rim, and I'm constantly counteracting the spin of the lathe. Now one way to know if you're going in the wrong direction is if your drill over accelerates. 
that means you're not going in the right direction, okay? Now the same thing goes, let's put it in reverse. Now, I'm going to counteract the spin going in the other direction using the middle to the left hand side this time up to the rim. Again. One thing else, I'm always going to clean out my bowl as I sand because what destroys sandpaper is heat and itself. And as it breaks down, it's in the wood fiber, so I want to clean the bowl out as I go. Otherwise, it'll break down the next grit much faster. That looks pretty good. Now, I want to give you an argument for having a lathe that reverses. You'll do a much better job power sanding if you can get a lathe that reverses. So basically, if I'm going 80 grit in one direction, I go 120 in another direction, 180 in the other direction, 220, and you'll get a much nicer sanding job. Okay, let's take a look at the back side of the bowl now. In the forward position here, I'm going to sand with the left hand side of the disc here, again counteracting going the opposite direction of the lathe. Using as much of the flat part of the disc as possible. And since I have a detail here, I'm going to sand in the other direction. Now, again, using the right hand side of the disc this time, counteracting the spin of the bowl. Let's have a discussion about sharpening our tools. There's nothing more important to a woodworker than a good sharp tool. Now we'll focus in on this fingernail grind because it's one of the more modern, most versatile gouges that we have. And if you can sharpen this tool, you can sharpen just about any other woodworking tool. Let's have a closer look. This is how we've drawn it here. There's my flute and it's pointed in that direction. There's my bevel and there's my cutting edge, my sweep. Okay, this is what I'm looking at in a well-designed tool. Now my bevel angle here and my sweep angle are at 45 degrees. This is 90, so half of that is 45. That's a good place to get started. I normally advocate a little sharper bevel than that, but for getting started, 45 is going to be just fine. I want my sweep or my cutting edge to be straight and my bevel here to be concave. That'll naturally happen because that's the arc of the grinding wheel that causes causes that concave surface. This whole surface here will be concave. Let's go ahead and grind one. A word about the grinder. I prefer a grinding wheel that is 8 inches in diameter and I like the grinder to spin at about 1800 RPMs. The grinding stone is also very important for the types of tool steels that we grind. The ones that come with the grinder probably are better at sharpening axes and lawnmower blades than they are at high speed steels like the ones we use. Your wood turning supply house will direct you to the proper stones that you need for your grinder. And I also suggest a aftermarket tool rest here that's much wider than the ones that normally come with a grinder. It gives you a lot more control when you're grinding your tools freehand. On my grinder here, I have a 46 grit wheel here on the right side that does all my rough grinding. And I have an 80 grit here that does the finer grinding for finishing up. Well, when I first get a new tool, I don't know what the factory has given me as a bevel. So I'll test it to see with this compass and we'll put that straight edge down the middle of the flute and it'll read out here on the top. And this one says 45 degrees. That's exactly where I want it. Now to set my platform, I'm going to guess where it is and I'm going to drop a known angle at 45 degrees and make sure that the bevel and the nose of the tool are in complete contact, that tells me that my platform here is at 45 degrees. That's exactly what I want. You can see that the bevel makes full contact with the grinding stone. Okay, it's really important to understand where to hold the tool when I grind. I will not hold the handle because if I held the handle, I'd have a temptation to lift the tool up without noticing it, and that would change my bevel angle. So I'll hold the handle, or I'll hold the tool above the ferrule here, and have both hands above the handle. Now, I'm going to lay 
the tool flat on the rest and I'll bring it up to meet the sweep here all the way across and I consistently hold the tool against the platform. That way I have a consistent bevel all the way across. Now it does require a steady hand in order to make this happen. That's a little bit of practice and perseverance on your part. Now let's turn this on. Make sure our platform is good and sturdy. Let's grind the nose of the tool. There we go. Let's get to the wing. And I drop the handle. Now I notice that there's a a burning red spark that's right on top of the cutting edge. That tells me I've met the cutting edge. So what I like to do is I like to hit the heel of the bevel on the grinding wheel first and then roll the, the cutting edge into the grinder. And once I have that cutting surface hot and red, I drop it down to meet another surface so I don't turn it blue. There we go, now I'm on the cutting edge and I drop the handle to meet a new surface and roll it to the nose. Now that's a nice fresh cutting edge. Little close up look. I put the heel of the gouge against the grinding wheel and then roll it into the cutting edge and then we'll see a hot spark on the cutting edge. There we go. That tells me I'm on the cutting edge. I'm going to drop the tool handle down. Very steady, consistent pressure. And there we go. Nice fresh cutting surface right there. And my sweep is straight. That's exactly what I want. Let's do the other side. The heel of the bevel makes contact first. Roll it into the cutting edge. There we are. Now I'm sharp. Drop the tool handle. All the way to the nose. Now I blended in a nice consistent bevel all the way through. Well, the longer the sweep is on the tool, the higher the tool will have to be brought up to present it to the cutting surface. Whereas with a traditional grind that doesn't have any sweep at all, can be held virtually perpendicular to the wheel and be brought around to meet the cutting surface. Let's take a closer look here at our fingernail grind. The reason we've swept back the wings here in the first place is it makes the tool more versatile. However, it doesn't cut as cleanly as a traditional grind. Now the traditional grind here has virtually no sweep at all. The problem with this tool is it doesn't get us very much access into our working area. But we'd rather have steeper wings like this because it generally gives us a cleaner cut and it handles end grain fibers better than a fingernail grind. Let's have a discussion here about spindle gouges. Typically spindle gouges have a shallow flute whereas bowl gouges are much deeper. They also have a very sharp bevel and a very sharp sweep and that gets us into very tight surfaces when we work with them. Spindle gouges are also good for bowls whereas bowl gouges aren't generally good for spindles. It's also very important to clean our wheel. We can't let anything build up on that wheel. We'll use a little cleaner here. And I'll go straight across and clean that. Keep the wheel straight, nice and flat. Let's sharpen our scraper now. The scraper only requires about a 70 degree bevel here, much duller than the fingernail grind. So I'll manipulate my platform so those two areas meet, the uh, bevel and the, and the scraping surface. And right there, this is one of the easiest tools to grind. Now, I'm going to keep the scraper right flat on the platform and just move it across the scraping surface there and give myself a nice burr over the top edge there. Real quick, easy maneuver. Once the bevel's set, it only takes a second.
There we go. And the way I know it's sharp is I can feel a burr right over the top. Let's sharpen our traditional grind. It too has a bevel of 45 degrees, which I constantly adjust depending on the depth of my bowl. I have the platform set at 45 degrees, so I keep it hard on the rest. And this too is a very easy gouge to grind because I don't have to rotate the tool up this way or that way. I could just keep it perpendicular to the wheel and just roll the the tool around until I hit the whole cutting surface. Nice fresh edge all the way around. Let's talk about finishes here. Finishes are a very subjective idea, but I'm going to break them down into two simple categories. We have membrane finishes and penetrating finishes. Membranes, of course, leave a film over the surface of the wood, whereas penetrating finishes go deeply into the surface. Now we have to consider the purpose for what we're putting on our product, because certain finishes are more appropriate than others for what we're making. Some of the considerations to think about before we apply a finish to our work. Now, do we have to have a very durable finish for the product that we're making? How about is it easy to use? How about is it easy to repair? Now, there's also other considerations, the marketability of the finish, and how about its toxicity? These are all things that we have to think about when we put finish on our work. Let's take a look at these membrane finishes here. Waxes, lacquers, and shellacs have a lot in common. They're easy to use, they're easy to repair and they have great marketability. That means that the general public loves the look of this finish on the wood. However, they're not that durable. So if I was making artistic items, these might be the finishes for me because artistic items don't take the abuse that utility items do. Let's talk about the epoxies and urethanes. I don't know of any other finish that's more durable than these two products here for our wood turnings. However, they're not that repairable. For instance, if I made a salad bowl and I had used one of these finishes and I've worn away a little bit of that finish over time and I try to reapply these finishes over that surface, they don't blend in too well without substantial labor on my part. Now what I'm saying is membrane finishes may be more suitable for artistic items than they are for utility. Let's take a look at some of our more popular penetrating finishes. We have tongue oil, linseed oil, nut oils, mineral oils, plus many other penetrating finishes that are marketed under numerous brand names. Now tongue oils and linseed oils are usually mixed with another ingredient to accelerate the drying process. Most penetrating oils are very slow drying and they also take considerably more coats to build up a shine if that's what you're looking for. The tongue and the linseed oils, when they're mixed with these accelerators to make them dry, make them very toxic. So we have to be very careful not to breathe or touch them while we work with them, similar to all these other products. They're perfectly safe when they dry to the end user, but as craftspeople, we really have to take care that we don't make contact with these finishes. Let's talk about these other two oils here, nut oils and mineral oils. Nut oils are generally walnut oils and almond oils because those are the only two nuts that will produce an oil that will harden. Now mineral oils never harden so they evaporate and so you have to constantly reapply this finish but it's easy to do and, and you can expect the general household to be able to do this so the maintenance is fairly simple. Nut oils the same, they're more permanent and they're easy to apply very durable and virtually non-toxic. You have to know that the penetrating oil type finishes will darken the timber and if you don't like that darkened look you have to go to the membrane type finishes but I happen to like the darkened look and over time these have a beautiful patina that make them look classic. Let's have a discussion about chucks. Like so many other wood turning tools, chucks have made huge advancements since the days when I first started to turn. Let's think about what the chuck is doing for us. Now as we cut a tenon for our chuck, the depth of our tenon isn't all that important unless it bottoms out into the bottom of the chuck here. And we don't want that because we want it to sit on the face of the chuck here. 
Now, keep in mind that the chuck is a much better holder when it's nearly closed down all the way because you're gripping on the total circumference of the tenon. But as you open it up, you're only gripping on eight points now. Therefore, it's not nearly as an effective holder while you're turning. A little discussion about wood turning tools. When you're first starting out, don't get all caught up into the numbers, the M2s, the M4s, the 2060, the A11s. It's not that important. What they're denoting is they're talking about the hardness of the tool steel. For instance, an M4 is twice as hard as an M2, and those little nuances aren't that important unless you get seriously involved into wood turning.